All right, Chapter 31, Confronting Global and National Dilemmas, 1989 to the Present. So this is our last chapter of this class. Congratulations. Okay, so this word globalization, uh, somewhat of a new word on the canvas of history. What, what does it mean exactly? According to your book, the spread of political, cultural, and economic influences and connections among countries, businesses, and individuals around the world through trade, immigration, and communication. Okay, so, so globalization is a relatively new term used to describe a very old process. It's an historical process that began when humans ventured out of Africa to spread all over the globe. Okay, so let's set the stage here for this chapter and start with the film. So go ahead and go to the Globalization 1, the Upside Crash Course film. Go ahead and watch that and come back when you're finished. Okay, so I, I said a long time ago that the, the history of the world is, is about the history of trade. So the history of human beings it parallels the history of trade because it's trade that, that got, got people to go out into the world and, and, and explore, okay? Uh, humans tend to want to improve their lives, so they interact with people, exchange goods, exchange ideas. But conflict sometimes happens, you know, over different ideologies, and we have wars, okay? Others want to dominate trade and corner the market, and history begins. So, so history really is all about trade, <clears throat> and that's what globalization means today. It's a continuation of an ages-old behavior between humans. Uh, <clears throat> so over thousands of years, <clears throat> excuse me. Distance has, large, has been largely overcome and human-made barriers lowered or removed. And this facilitates the exchange of goods and ideas. <clears throat> All helped along by technology. Of course, today, email, websites, cell phones. You know, this has changed the world dramatically in the last 20 years. Uh, they'll be looking back at our era 100 years from now as the communications era and how how the world became a different place. It's one of those paradigm shifts I keep on talking about. So, so progress is helped by technology, uh, the, and both the interconnectedness and the interdependence between people have grown. So interconnectedness, but also interdependence, okay, grows. The world gets smaller symbolically. Uh, and you have this increasing integration of the world <clears throat> or globalization, okay? Uh, so globalization has enriched life, but it's also created some new problems. Okay, we talked about homogeni homogenization. The world has become more complex as technology and easy travel mixes cultures without homogenizing them. <clears throat> so what does this mean? Uh, as, the, as the world becomes global, we, we, we become more like each other and we lose our cultural identities, okay? The, the, the big players in trade tend to exert their influence. That, that's America, right? It means more sales, okay? Smaller players want to be like them. So they take on their characteristics as individuals and as countries. So you have a reduction in culture and it makes us all become kind of more the same, okay? Uh, <clears throat> So the end of the Cold War changed the global environment of the world. It used to be the United States versus the Soviet Union, two countries that were very opposite, capitalism versus communism. And the politics of the world were shaped by what these two were up to, right? But since the Cold War, uh, other, other areas have exerted themselves, Asia, Europe, <clears throat> and have become players in the world's economics and politics, okay? Uh, 1992, the EU was formed, the European Union, uh, and this is to create a single state in Europe. Uh, not not to suggest that, that they all became one country, <clears throat> but they all come together, and in, in, you know, to to work together and create a single state. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm having a tough time with my my voice here today. Uh, so what is this? It's an economic and political union between 28 European countries which covers much of the European continent. So this, I, this idea began in the aftermath of World War II to create economic cooperation. <clears throat> Countries that trade with one another become economically interdependent, so you're more likely to avoid conflict. This goes all the way back to Will, uh, Woodrow Wilson's idea of the League of Nations that, that didn't go through. Then you have the UN. It's very similar. 
Uh, but the EU promotes human rights both internally and around the world. Uh, they promote human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights. These are the core values of the EU. Uh, they're focused on making their institutions more transparent <clears throat> and more democratic, okay? But what's happening recently in the EU? Uh, uh, England, Britain, wants to leave. Uh, so they, you have what's called Brexit or Britain exiting the EU, okay? That's what Brexit means. Uh, they want to be an independent entity. They want to determine their own laws in future. Okay, so this has kind of created a bit of a turmoil. All right, you remember uh, the reason why the League of Nations after World War One did not uh, pass is because America wanted to maintain their own foreign policy and they wanted their own trade networks. They didn't want to get get locked into what Europe was doing and and get stuck there. So here you now Britain's doing the same thing in, in this modern era okay <clears throat> okay so go ahead and watch our next film take a break here brexit 101 the uk's eu referendum explain go ahead and watch that and i'll come back and when you're finished okay so it would be interesting to see what will happen down the road with the with the eu okay okay other players china has become a huge player in the modern economy a uh, major player in world economics in fact, in the 21st century, they have achieved a higher economic growth than America has. What's significant about that? That causes um, American jobs, okay, Americans, their jobs, even though America continues to buy Chinese products. We talked about Walmart and how cheap their products are because they pay cheap labor in poorer countries than, than they would have to here, okay? And in America, the minimum wage is going up. <clears throat> it's it's proposed to reach fifteen dollars uh, per hour in California. Okay, so what's going to happen? And that's that's great for people, especially young people and uh, older people that have been maybe uh, you know laid off from their from their uh, career. Okay, uh, this allows you to make you know. A, some, some, somewhat more of a decent living. Okay, but what happens? The overseas labor will become more attractive to manufacturers. This will continue to erode the American economic base. Okay, and people think it's about kids. Look at the the, the uh, slide here. You know, it's it's about a teenager that works part time after school, earning extra spending money. I mean, that's that's not really what it is anymore. <clears throat> and, and of course, if you if you look at that argument, what is the argument against that? Why, why are we raising the minimum wage when kids don't need more money to live with their parents? What, what do they need money for? Okay. Uh, when Obama was president, he talked about an increase in jobs. And there was an increase in jobs after a very poor economy. But, but most of them are low paid and low hours. So you don't, you don't have full-time jobs. You don't have benefits. And, you, and you're getting paid minimum wage. I'm talking adults here. So look at the reality. The average age getting paid minimum wage is 35 years old, 88% are 20 or older, 36% are, are, are 40 or older, 56% are women, 28% have children, 55% work full time. On average, they earn half of their family's total income. But at minimum wage in, in today's world, especially in San Diego, an expensive city, it doesn't pay the bills. You you can't afford the rents or the mortgage payments, you know, uh, uh, with a minimum wage job. So what do what do people do? They get more than one job. And you might know people, especially older people, that uh, you know work work two three jobs to to get by. Okay, um, a friend of mine was a um, a cable TV installer for many years, and she did great. She made good money. But she got older. She reached 50, and they decided to lay her off. Well, where does a 50-year-old woman go that her, her background's cable installing? You know, she doesn't have much opportunity. So she now works for, you know, a market and a couple other jobs, minimum wage jobs, and she's working all the time to try to keep up her lifestyle, okay? So the minimum wage is very controversial, and there's a, there's a plus and a minus to it for sure. Uh... So let's take another break here. This is a, this next film is a short film about the upsides and the downsides to raising our minimum wage. So watch the film. Should the minimum wage be raised? Okay, and then come back. Thank you. Okay. So talking uh, 
just con continue with with uh, kind of the organization of the world and the globalization. Uh, the Group of Eight is another organization. Uh, capitalist countries, including Russia. What? So Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia, United Kingdom, America. So Russia in a capitalist group. That that alone tells us how much the world econ economic environment has changed. So, so this group, the Group of Eight, controls the world's economy and the World Bank, the international, the International Monetary Fund. We talked about the IMF and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Talked about that before too. Okay, uh, the, these people. Th this is a powerful group here. So, so globalization also means consolidating countries for advantage and power. I mean, isn't that kind of a modern international form of monopoly? I mean, what would Teddy Roosevelt think? Okay, so what is NAFTA? A very controversial agreement that uh, our President Donald Trump today is very much against and trying to uh, overturn. Uh, this is an agreement that was that was that came into being when Clinton was president. Okay, uh, agreement between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. So, so the North American uh, countries, a North American trade agreement. Okay. So, so American corporations now have a global a address. It's not not just American anymore. It's a multinational corporations that are also multi international. Okay. So the end of the Cold War opened up new opportunities for trade worldwide, and deregulation of financial institutions and markets have allowed a free market to flourish, and spectacular profits have resulted. Consumerism is worldwide now. It's a product of the uh, Western world, okay? <clears throat> and what's what's fueling it? Technology. Uh, it, it's it's booming. It's it's going faster than we can keep up with it. So, <clears throat> technology, as we all know, exploded as the new millennium approached and beyond, communicating in ways that were never imagined. Uh, the World Wide Web in 1991 revolutionized nearly every aspect of people's lives. And now we have personal computers, cell phones, camera phones, all changed the way people lived. Yeah, I remember not too long ago, um, I don't know, maybe 10, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, where a friend of mine texted me a picture that she took at a baseball game in Seattle. So I opened up my, my text and Here's an image, and it was her at the game waving, and I thought, what what am I looking at here? And I and I realized that, well, clearly she's ahead of me te technologically in those days, but but I didn't I didn't I didn't understand that. Wow, she just texted me a picture of herself at the game. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Of course, now we just take it for granted and we do it all the time. But it was only 10, 12 years ago that that that, that technology started. Okay, uh, and this is commonplace today. Uh, I remember a, uh, a television ad where you have a split screen, and on, on the left screen is a company in Los Angeles. On the right screen of the screen is a company in New York. And they're all, you know, fretting and, and concerned and worried. And the, the people in Los Angeles are saying, we got to get this document to them today. We can't overnight it. It's got to get there today. What do we do? And the people in New York are saying, we got to have that document today. What are they doing over there? And suddenly one guy in L.A. says, I'll take care of it. He grabs, takes the document and he puts it flat and he puts it into something and it goes across the, it goes across the split in the screen and the people in New York get it. And I'm like, wait a minute. You just, you just put that document through a machine and it came out in New York? And that's what it was. And that, that was absolutely stunning. The world changed. That's the fax machine. That was incredible. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. But yet, how many people use fax machines today? That was 10, 10 12 years ago, 15 maybe. Uh, nobody uses a fax machine today. We, we, we um, you know, just, just uh, uh, it's all text or computer, right? We attach do uh, documents and, and it's easy as, as, as anything, right? Uh, so... I remember my first cell phone. Um, this is going back probably uh, maybe 25, 20, 25 years. And uh, I owned a business, construction business. And when I when I needed to talk to my foreman prior to having a phone, I would have to go to a phone booth, which of course don't exist anymore. You go to a phone booth, call their pager, 
and type in 911. I would then have to sit by that phone booth, wait for my, my foreman to leave his job, go find a phone, call me back to tell him what's going on. I mean, that was better than what, what we had before. You know, you couldn't reach anybody before. So pages were great. Then along comes cell phones. So I remember my, my first my first cell phone was uh, was huge. I mean, it had, I don't know, it was a foot long. And I had a little uh, carrying case on my on my belt. You'd pull out this, you know, one foot long antenna. It was huge. And I remember st- I was standing on the on the top of a three-story building, construction site, and I just simply called my foreman and he answered the phone. Hello? You know, because he had one too. And I, I, I just, I couldn't believe it, you know. So all this stuff sounds like, you know, come on. But I mean, in, in my lifetime, all those things happen. And it wasn't that long ago, 10, 20 years, the world's completely changed. So technology, moving faster than you could keep up with, moving at a pace that's never been seen before. And hard to keep up with. Uh, we talked in the past about technology had outpaced tactics in the Civil War and later World War One. Is it possible to, that a streaking technology will have an adverse effect on society today? We'll see. But the same old arguments are still out there. Religion versus secularity. Okay. Uh, and this this enters into politics, and you have a culture war between religion and secularity. This continues to be a struggle in modern America. You know, religion typically, not always, but typically coincides with conservatism, and secularity with liberals. So we're we're back to Republicans versus Democrats, same as it ever was, right? An entire century and a half has gone by. America is still about. Republicans versus Democrats, same issues, big government versus small government, civil rights versus self-determination. Uh, but the world's become multicultural. Uh, can, can, you, can you still define America as a white European-based people? Not really. You know, slowly and painfully at times and painfully still. America today is defined as not a single type of people to be integrated with uh, or Americanized. So it's not it's not one type of people. It's a diverse, uh, multicultural country. OK. Uh, America is a diverse collection of many different types of people who have entered the mainstream. Remember that we talked about very early in the class. I, I said, it, you know, the, the racial problems in America began when when non-white people tried to enter the mainstream, when the slaves were freed, Native Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian women, uh, trying to enter the mainstream that was controlled by who? By white men, going way back. Uh, we've come a long way. We're still fighting that 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 issue, okay? So, uh, so different types of people entering the mainstream to have their shot at the American pie, um, and different ethnicities coming together, living and working together. But it's complicated and hard to find. I'm sorry, hard to define. Let's take another break here and watch our next film. It kind of has a different perspective. Are some cultures better than others? So go ahead and watch that film. Okay, so um, you're trying to level, trying to level as, as the as America grows and becomes. Um, uh, Multicultural. You you look back on on practices and in, in, in legislation that was passed that was not fair. Okay, uh, and we've talked a lot about them, Plessy and, and on and on. Okay, uh, these these uh, the, all the Jim Crow law. This is unconstitutional. So so uh, you come up with this idea to try to um, level the playing field. Okay. But when we talked about affirmative action, you know, which was a which was an attempt to try to get uh, formerly oppressed peoples a, a chance at getting their, their shot at getting educations and, and jobs too, but that was outlawed in California with the passing of Prop Two Not Two O Nine. Immigration is 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 seen as an evil now. Okay, wasn't the way it always was. Wasn't America built on immigration? Uh, I know both sets of my grandparents came through Ellis Island in the 1920s from Europe. You know, lots of people. That's a proud moment. That's what America's about, freedom, getting people ch- a chance to better their lives. 
But yet today, we don't, we don't feel that way. America's changed their point of view about immigration. Uh, Patrick Buchanan was a Republican campaigning for the presidency. This is back in 92. And he said, America is undergoing the greatest invasion in its history. What's he talking about? He's talking about the migration of millions of illegal aliens a year from Mexico. Okay. So, you know, the, the idea about immigration's change from what it was at the turn of the 20th century. If you go back to there, the turn of the 20th century, the immigrants, immigrants coming through Ellis Island became legendary and is a proud moment in America's history. And there's a plaque at the Statue of Liberty. What's the Statue of Liberty? The symbol of freedom that, that European immigrants look to. And when they see the, the Statue of Liberty, they, they, they know that they've reached freedom, okay? If you go to the Statue of Liberty today, there's a plaque on there with a poem called the New Colossus. And uh, this, this kind of talks about America's point of view about immigration at the turn of the 20th century, but it's changed now. And here's a quote from Robin Williams. The Statue of Liberty is no longer saying, give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses. She's got a baseball bat and yelling, you want a piece of me? So it's changed, okay? Uh, so what is this poem? Um, this, this, this was America's ideology at the turn of the 20th century. So let's look at this. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs to stride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sun sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame uh, is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send those, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. There's a whole lot going on here. Let's just go over it real quick. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride stride from land to land. So the, so the Statue of Liberty is not a a uh, you know romanticized Greek god that's perfect in every way. It's just it's just a woman with a torch saying you're welcome here. So here she is, a mighty woman with the torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name the mother of exiles. Well, what's an exile? People that have been banished from someplace else, right? From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air bridge harbor that twin cities frame. <coughs> Excuse me. What she means by Twin Cities in those days, she's talking about New York City and uh, Brooklyn, okay? Keep ancient lands your story pomp. That, that's a, there's a whole lot going on that, in that sentence. There, there, she's saying, Europe, we don't want to be like you. We don't, we don't like your ways. We, we're about freedom, equality, liberty, and so on. But then here's the part that, that perhaps we've, we've deviated from today, okay? With silent lips, give me your tired, your poor. Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Okay, tired, poor, huddled masses, wretched refuse. What is refuse? Trash, wretched trash. Send these, the homeless. Tired, poor, masses, trash, homeless. Send those to me. I'll lift my lamp beside the golden door. So she's not saying send me your PhD, send me your... Smart people send me your rich people send me your athletes. She's not saying that. She's saying send me send me the worst of what you have. Okay. Today the president criticizes uh, his, uh, Hispanic immigrants from Mexico as being criminals and rapists and 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 so on. Um, you know I think if you have a thousand uh, people of any group, you're going to find some that that are are those things. No question about it. Uh, one of his aides recently uh, said, we don't mind uh, immigrants from Mexico as long as they have an education, they have money, and they can start a business and benefit America's economy. I mean, that, that, that all makes sense on some level, I suppose. Um, but that's not how America started, okay? So that, that's, a, that's a deviation from wh where they started. Uh, and here's proof of it right here. This, this is what America was about 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Uh, has it changed regarding immigration? Yes, it has. 
what's different about it well it, it's not my argument okay so don't get don't get crazy on me here but but many people question okay and I'm sure I've mentioned this before is Donald Trump trying to make America great again or is he trying to make America white again because the people that he's having problems with Hispanic people and Middle Eastern people aren't white is that what this issue is about is, is is that the real problem remember we, remember we go back to our discussion about um, uh, Donald Trump and nativism you know you're, you're trying to, to to cut people out and create a a more white country is that what's going on here so that that's one of the criticisms of Donald Trump and um, again certainly not mine at mine I'm, I'm just simply stating the facts here I'm not trying to sway you one way or the other but just look at at what the world's saying that's criticism of him going you know that that idea of, of becoming isolationist again when you're out there as the world leader you know hopefully with with benevolence not that America has its moments where maybe it's it's greedy and selfish too but for the most part benevolent uh, do you want to draw back from that and close your close your 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 uh, your uh, harbors from people and put walls up you know is that what you want to do so this so this poem's pretty inspiring okay if you if you look back at this okay but you know again it's changed uh, his immigration plans uh, the opposite of that uh, you know get get rid of people move uh, uh, send them back now now of course the argument is they're illegal well that's that's true and there's no question about that and that needs to be dealt with and but I mean, do you do you just simply, you know, disrupt families and and send them back right away? Children that have no clue or concept about what illegal means that, that are, you know, ensconced in a neighborhood and a school now now they're just going back. Do you, do you really build a wall? Is that what is that what America's about? Okay. Uh, the poem says, "Give me your wretched refuse. Give me your tired, your poor." Okay, so when he calls them pimps and drug dealers, rapists and criminals, you're you're gonna have that that uh, that possibility in a free country. You know, you, you can't call it a free country if you're gonna racially profile people for what you think they might be, right? So so are 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 we are we playing with fire here? Is Trump playing with fire with our most sacred uh, cornerstone ideologies, okay? Okay, but as America progresses into a new millennium, and we're, we're, in, it, we're in it almost 20 years now, it, it, it can look back on huge progress, right? America's made huge progress, civil rights, human rights. We talked about the civil rights movement not, not that long ago and, and where it was just, just really 40 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, my lifetime, um, and to where it is today. But it's still there, right? It's, it's still an issue. The haunting scepter of racism is still there. Still working on a problem that's existed in America for 400 years. 400 years, and America still deals with the issue of the color of a person's skin in modern society. Ha has politics embraced this problem? You know, the the election, uh, this election of 2016, Trump and, and Clinton is one of the most contentious elections ever. Uh, was race an issue in the campaigning? Was race an issue in American society? Okay, this is kind of an interesting cartoon here. The the, the man in the middle, and I suppose he's representing the you know white middle class, upper upper class. It's time to reclaim America from illegal immigrants. He's pointing at a at an Hispanic family that that perhaps came from Mexico, right? get these people out of here the native americans saying i'll help you pack because you're you're you, what are you talking about we're the people that were here you know you're you're illegal too if as far as far as we're concerned so you know you have this constant struggle and battle uh you know it, it seems like it's going nowhere and perhaps a different approach would be a better way to to, to solve it okay okay um but you have this rise of conservatism still going, popular throughout the last 30 years, the 20th century, and still today. Family values, we've talked about that. Should politics have a say in these types of subjects? Should religion be part of the political process? Not according to the First Amendment, but here it is. We hear about it all the time. People are judged by what their religion is or they're praised for it. You know, there's... Uh, many people vote for people because of their religion. You know, I don't, 
Um, I'm not sure how much religion has to do with running a country and and managing a worldwide <clears throat> global e uh, economy. Okay, but but religion versus politics, and we have we have lots of controversial, divisive subjects that that divide us uh, as a people and divide us politically. Okay, birth control, abortion, homosexuality, gay marriage, global warming, the environment, nuclear power. Uh, all divisive subjects that all have become political. So it still boils down to uh, Republicans versus Democrats, conservatives versus liberals, religion versus secularity. We still have that issue. It's a big one. Okay, um, moving on with politics. So after George Bush Sr. was not reelected, uh, Bill Clinton becomes the next president, 42nd president of the United States. Now, we talked last class about how George Bush Sr. had crashed and burned after a huge approval of his handling of the Gulf War. Uh, he came back down to earth by letting Saddam Hussein go, as well as other things. Uh, so, so Clinton uh, brought the Reagan Democrats back to the party. Remember, remember I said when Reagan was elected, a lot of Democrats went with him, changed parties. Well, they didn't change parties, but they voted for, for, for Reagan. Clinton brings those the, those people back into the fold, back into the, in the Democratic Party, and consolidates the party. Uh, Clinton is, is the one exception to a period of Republican domination <clears throat> that went for a long time. And <clears throat> a different type of candidate, the first, the first uh, president to come out of the 60s. This, he's a baby boomer, and he was looked at as a little wild. Possibly he had evaded the draft. Maybe he had smoked marijuana. Imagine that. Uh, there was no question he was a womanizer and had repeatedly been unfaithful to his wife. Okay, This was public knowledge. Who's his wife? Hillary Clinton, the, the woman that, that uh, lost uh, the, the election uh, to Donald Trump. <clears throat> but going back to Clinton, 1992, also young. Uh, of the baby boom generation that turned their back on the values of the greatest generation. Uh, at the Democratic convention that nominated him, rock and roll was played for the first time in a convention. Fleetwood Mac, a huge band of the 1970s, performed live after his acceptance speech. Okay, He played the saxophone on a late night talk show with sunglasses on, playing jazz saxophone. So not exactly a person of the greatest generation <clears throat> and this was contagious <clears throat> to the aging baby boomers okay they felt like they were finally in charge they're finally in power you know george bush senior before before clinton was a world war ii veteran and a hero but of the greatest generation again so so clinton beats him in 1992 at age 46 the third youngest president in history and famous for a number of 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 things the family and medical leave act Violence Against Women Act, also bills pertaining to crime and gun violence, education, the environment, welfare reform. He put forth measures to reduce the federal budget deficit. He signed the North American Free Trade Agreement, that's NAFTA, <clears throat> which of course, like I mentioned before, today is very controversial and, and Trump's trying to get rid of that. NAFTA eliminated, or it meant to anyway, it eliminated trade barriers between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, okay? So who's this? That's Hillary when she was young, <clears throat> okay? The first lady, okay? Was she, she was Bill Clinton's first lady. And he appointed her uh, to be in charge and, uh, of, of health insurance, and she tried to enact universal health insurance for all Americans. The plan was opposed by conservatives and the health care industry, and Congress did not approve it. So she was, she was defeated, and it was, a, it was a huge defeat for her. But this is where she steps onto the political stage for the first time as, as the first lady um, you know, of her husband. And, of course, she continues on today where she's a politician today. Uh, Clinton, Bill Clinton, appointed women and minorities to, to key government posts. Uh, Janet Reno, the first female U.S. Attorney General in 1993. Okay. Uh, Madeleine Albright, first female U.S. Secretary of State, 1997 appoints Ruth Bader Ginsburg, became the second female. Remember, Reagan appointed the first one uh, to the Supreme Court in 1993. 
So Clinton, you know, hits the ground running and his his first term goes really well. Uh, the economy is is robust and booming. OK, and this makes him very, very popular. So he's elected to a second term in 1996. OK, uh, the, the, the American <clears throat> the American economy was healthy. <clears throat> Unemployment was low and the nation experienced a major technology boom and the rise of the Internet. We talked before about this happening. This this whole communication age happens in this era. Uh <clears throat> In 1998, the United States achieved its first federal budget surplus in three decades. That's a big one. Okay. <clears throat> also had some military engagements during his, his administration. Uh, 1998, America launched air attacks against Iraq, against their nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons programs. Okay. And he went on TV like all the rest. Earlier today, I ordered America's armed forces to strike military and security targets in Iraq. They are joined by British forces. <clears throat> so America hears this on TV. <clears throat> in 1999, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> in 1999, the United States led a NATO, remember North America Treaty Organization, NATO effort to end ethnic cleansing in Kosovo during their fight for uh, independence from Serbia. Okay, so his his administration was was going along very very nicely, but then his second term was marred by scandal. Okay, <clears throat> um, uh, December nineteenth, nineteen ninety eight, the House of Representatives impeached him for perjury and obstruction of justice regarding a sexual relationship he had with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. Okay, so we when this class started. We talked about Andrew Johnson being the first president ever impeached. He was he was not removed, but here's the second one. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so go ahead and take a break here and watch the film entitled "The Clinton Lewinsky Sex Scandal," and then come back. Okay, so February 12, 1999, the Senate acquits Clinton and he remains in office. Okay, what was the crime that he did? He he lied to the American public about having an affair. Now, you know, as, as awful as that might might seem, and I'm not, and it is, it's not against the law to have an affair. Okay, you can have an affair. You're not going to lose your job. Uh, so they they decided that it wasn't, you know, that that big of a crime what he did. He, he didn't do what Nixon did or what Reagan did. He just had an affair and then lied about it. That's, that's hardly going to uh, shift the foreign policy of America. But truth is, he did lie about it under oath in front of, in front of uh, TV cameras. So he, he, that's, that's what he was acquitted, uh, I'm sorry, impeached for, not for having an affair, for lying about it, okay? <clears throat> and so, so he's acquitted, but the, but the Republicans gain, you know, gain from this, and they gain a majority in the House of Representatives. First time in over 40 years that they had that. Another indication that America was still in a conservative era, okay? <clears throat> when Clinton's term comes to an end, uh, George Bush Sr.'s son, George W. Bush, he becomes the, uh, the president. So the second time in America's history that there's a father and son, going way back to John Adams and John Quincy Adams in the ninth, early 19th, late 17th, I'm sorry, uh, late 18th and early 19th century, <clears throat> now in the 21st century and 20th, you have to have father and son again. <clears throat> so uh, his first term is mostly dominated by the attacks uh, in on 9/11, on terrorist attacks against America, and you know different targets, uh, the World Trade Center, uh, the Pentagon, the, the White House, uh, all targets. 3,000 people killed on that day. Uh, for those of us that remember that day, those these images of these buildings being on fire and airplanes crashing into them will forever be burned into our brain, okay? So I want you to take a break and watch this next film. This is mostly audio and video of that day as these horrible events took place. Now understand that some of this has been dramatized, especially in the beginning, just a little bit, but um, but for the most part, it's it's... It's a primary source of just film of that day, okay? 
So go ahead and watch that film, 9-11, September 11th, 2001, Attack on the World Trade Center. Okay, so, so why did they attack America? Uh, Osama bin Laden is the leader of Al-Qaeda, and he had declared a holy war against the United States. And he called for the killing of Americans, okay? And he, he spelled out his reasons why. And to him, it was a holy war. <clears throat> why, why are we so anti-America? Because America supports Israel. Uh, America supports attacks against Muslims in Somalia. Uh, America supported Russian atrocities against Muslims in Chechnya. Uh, now understand, this is all according to him. Uh, there were, there were pro-American governments in the Middle East being against Muslim interests. Uh, Americans supported Indian oppression against Muslims in Kashmir. There were, there were American troops in Saudi Arabia. There were sanctions imposed against Iraq. So all these things are, are, are why he did it. And, you know, as shocked as America was by the attack, Bin Laden said he was coming. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I think one of the one of the questions about the 9/11 uh, incident is is the government was kind of sleeping. They, they 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 didn't see it coming. They should have seen it coming. You know, why wasn't that second plane shot out of the sky? It, it was pretty clearly it had turned around, was flown in a lo low altitude, going coming in. There had already been one that hit a building. Why wouldn't Why wouldn't the Air Force take that plane out? It was like they didn't know what they were doing. So this this makes this didn't make Bush look real good being the commander in chief. Okay, uh, so this this horrifying event happens. <clears throat> this is an event that was very similar, although much much worse as far as the loss of uh, people. <clears throat> but <clears throat> a very similar, you know, incident, a, a polarizing incident. One of those one of those few incidents in American history that will, that will stand out, much like Pearl Harbor. Okay, this is a big one. So a month after the attacks, America invades Afghanistan to overthrow the, the, the Taliban the Taliban Taliban government, I'll say, suspected of harboring Osama bin Laden, leader of Al Qaeda. So the Taliban government is suspected of of, of you know hiding bin Laden. Uh, bin Laden is the person that was responsible for the 9-11 attacks. Okay, so the Taliban is defeated, but Bin Laden is not captured. Okay, uh, okay, so Bush signs the Patriot Act into law. So what was that? Uh, this gave powers to the U.S. Department of Justice, the National, National Security Agency, or NS, NS, NSA, regarding domestic and international surveillance. So what did that do? It removed legal barriers that had blocked law enforcement in the past, including intelligence and defense agencies from sharing information about potential terrorists and, co and coordinating efforts to respond to them. So that sounds good. I mean, a, a tighter, uh, more communicative uh, law enforcement uh, presence in America. That we this 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 uh, incident caught America sleeping, much like Pearl Harbor. So America's concerned. So let's make it easier for different organizations to communicate. But there's always a, a second and another side to it, the yin and the yang, right? Pa the Patriot Act also raised concerns uh, <clears throat> about civil liberties groups and privacy rights of American citizens. <clears throat> so, ag again, we, we don't have a... a, a uh, culture that's like Big Brother. <clears throat> what is Big Brother? The book 1984, George L. Orwell talks about a society where the government's watching what you're doing. So they have, there's cameras in your, in your uh, house, in your bedroom, in your bathroom, at your workplace. The government's always watching you. They're called Big Brother, making sure that you don't misstep. That's not a free country, okay? If you're going to have a free country, you're going to have people that will that will take advantage of it, perhaps, and and go in a direction that maybe most people wish that they wouldn't. But that's that's part of, of being a free country, okay? But now you've got this idea that now the the uh, civil liberty groups are complaining, American citizens are complaining that this Patriot Act is has they're they're taking it too far. Uh, information came out in 2013 showing that the 
that the agency was using the law of the Patriot Act to justify the bulk collection of data from millions of phone calls and texts, okay? So I don't know if you know it. I hope you know it. Everything that is said in text, it can be collected. And data can be used to possibly form conclusions that go against the American civil rights. And, the, and there's been situations where a, a young person, uh, let's say a young, a young man graduates college and gets a degree and goes to a company to apply for a job and they have a security clearance and and it, part of the security clearance is going back and reading all of his texts and, and, and phone messages. And when you were 15, you made a racist comment. So we're not going to hire you. Maybe he's 24 today. Should, should a person be, be held responsible for a comment they made nine years ago when they were a kid? Should, should, the, should the organizations have the right in a free country to go back and, and look into your private information? But they do because this act allows them to, okay? Uh, so how do you feel about that? So now when you're texting your friends and you're thinking you have your – it all, it's all private, it's not. And, uh, you know, you can uh, – some people are getting in trouble for uh, what is categorized as pornography in texting, okay? So um, is this is, – is this all – you know, things that we want as a country. I think that everybody wants to have a, a better defense, but at the expense of our freedoms, America clings to its freedoms. American people don't like having their freedoms taken away, okay? Okay, uh, let's watch our next film here. This is a short film on the negatives of this act. So understand the context here. Understand what you're listening to, okay? Many people would claim that, that this is false information or fake news. So go ahead and watch the film, the Patriot Act classic, okay? Okay, so what do you think? Is it necessary in today's terrorist environment for national safety to have this type of act? Or does it violate personal rights guaranteed in the Constitution, okay? Uh, okay, the Patriot Act also created the cabinet-level Department of Homeland Security, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so back to Saddam Hussein. Remember, remember George Bush didn't take him out. Spring of 2003, he's back. And uh, uh, the United States invade Iraq to overthrow him. Again, you're starting a whole new military expedition here that could, that could escalate into a full-scale war. You had him back, you know, 10 years ago, but you let him go. Uh, okay, so... Uh, Hussein was accused of supporting terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, and possessing large amounts of weapons of mass destruction, WMDs. This is something that becomes very, very controversial, okay? So uh, he's finally captured in 2003, December of 2003. He's captured, later executed by Iraqi officials. Uh, this whole uh, invasion was, was based on finding nuclear weapons, nuclear stockpiles, but none were discovered. None were found, okay? <clears throat> uh, so this, uh, this did not, also did not uh, 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 make George Bush look real good either, okay? This was his, his baby. WMDs were, were, his, were his kind of idea. We got to go get these, and they, they do, and they're not there. Uh, but he, you know, he, he had a, a, a fair um, uh, administration also, won congressional approval for tax cut bills, Medicare prescription drug coverage for, for seniors. He signed the No Child Left Behind Act into law, very controversial act that's still going on today. He allocated billions of dollars to fight HIV AIDS. This is an, an uh, epidemic that mostly affected in those days the gay community. It, and many people saw it as the, uh, many of the, you know, religious right saw HIV and AIDS as kind of, you know, the, the payback for having a gay lifestyle, okay? Um, of course, that's not really what it was at all, but that's how it was, how it was seen. Uh, he also created the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. But he withdrew support of the 1997 Kyoto Protocol that had been signed by Bill Clinton and intended to combat worldwide global warming. 
much like Trump did the same thing in the, with the Paris Agreement that was signed by Obama regarding global warming. Uh, conservative American Republicans don't see global warming as a real issue. Okay, they 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 don't believe that it's really a threat. Okay. Uh, Bush felt the international agreements requirements hurt the American economy. Okay. So he was reelected in 2004, uh, had strong public approval ratings throughout his first term, but in his second term, his popularity would plummet. Uh, <clears throat> he had used misleading claims about Iraq's WMDs, and many people thought it was just the justification for invading that Middle Eastern nation. <clears throat> you, had a, you had a hurricane, uh, Hurricane Katrina, a, a huge uh, uh, natural disaster. It devastated America's Gulf Coast region in August 2005, resulting in some 1,800 deaths and billions of dollars in damage. So here you see people on their roofs breaking through the, you know, going up into their attic and breaking through the roof to get get outside because because the bottom floors are flooded. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so the Bush administration was widely criticized for its slow response to the, this disaster. It didn't move very fast especially in regard to lower income areas. And there were accusations that he had a disinterest in helping the black areas. Okay. <clears throat> uh, but the, but his worst uh, problem in his second term was the economy. Okay. Uh, it, it plummets. A troubled economy hurt him bad. <clears throat> he began his presidency with a federal budget surplus member from Clinton. Uh, but the factors such as fighting the enormous cost of fighting two wars and his tax cuts led to annual budget deficits starting in 2002. 2008, the country goes into a huge depression, the worst, the worst financial crisis since uh, the Great Depression of the 30s. Uh, <clears throat> so this is kind of the, the result of, of all, all, the, all these, uh, this idea of, of what's going on with surpluses and so on, okay? Okay, um, Congress passed. So, so you have this. You have this depression. Congress passes controversial Bush-sponsored plans to bail out the financial industry, to bail out the auto industry, by giving them hundreds of billions of dollars in federal funds. Of course, the everyday American that just just lost half their uh, half their savings, half their retirement. Many lost their homes, many lost their jobs, many lost everything. They're, they're screaming, well, what about me? You're, you're, you're bailing out the, these industries. What about me? You know, uh, what are you going to do for me? I'm, I'm, I'm hurting too, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and watch our next film here. And this is called The 2008 Financial Crisis, Crash Course Economics Number 12. Uh, go ahead and watch that video and then we'll come back. Okay, so people are disillusioned. Many lost half their life savings. It left a very bad taste in their mouths that, 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 that Bush and Congress bailed out these industries. And the truth is it was a tough choice for him, but, but he kept these industries alive. It was smart because those industries created jobs in the future for people that lost their jobs, okay? But George uh, Bush Jr. leaves his uh, two-term presidency with a very low popularity, you know, after being popular in his first term. So very similar to his father. It starts with a boom and ends with a whimper, okay? So the climate changes back to liberalism after Bush's administration disappointed in the end. And for the first time in America's history, an African-American is elected president, uh, uh, Barack Obama. And very much like Franklin Roosevelt in 1932, elected in the worst of possible times for a president, inherited a near impossible situation, much like much like Roosevelt with the Depression. Uh, so what does Obama do? He addressed the global financial crisis with a major stimulus package, uh, trying to stimulate the economy worldwide. He worked towards a financial regulation reform bill. He extended some of Bush's tax cuts, um, and he worked to reform health care. He ends the U.S. military involvement in Iraq. Also noted for uh, appointing Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor 
the first Hispanic American on the Supreme Court. So initially, when Obama came into office, Democrats controlled both houses of Congress. But Republicans won a majority in the House in 2010. So Obama and congressional Republicans engaged in a standoff for the rest of his administration. Okay, He was reelected in 2012, uh, uh, known for fighting climate change, uh, signing an executive order to limit carbon emissions, and a major international climate agreement uh, that we know Donald Trump has undone since. Uh, also worked for the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but but then Republicans won control of the Senate after 2014. So now you got the House and the Senate with you know the, the opposite party of Obama. So it's pretty hard to get your get your policies through when the when the when Congress is is, is against you. Okay. So Obama continued to fight for the rest of his administration with congressional Republicans over spending, immigration, judicial nominations and, and really most other issues okay and who becomes president after him Donald Trump very surprising choice uh, a man with no political background uh, a, a man that had had ups and downs in his career uh, and he comes in with a with a like a like a John Wayne uh, you know he's gonna do it my way get out of the way I'm changing everything and so people want it they didn't, they didn't want, they were tired of politicians, so you know, let, let's bring in some, something new, and, and they did. So, you know, his his uh, his presidency has been very controversial on many fronts. Uh, we talked before about, it, it, you know, is there a return nativism to isolationism? Is there is there a rise of white nationalism because of Trump? Does he support that? Is he anti-immigration? Okay, so we have all these issues that we, that we talk about today. So we started this class in Reconstruction, and I think that, I hope anyway, that uh, a number of the incidents that happened there, that the three amendments uh, that freed the slaves, gave them a vote, gave them citizenship, but then Jim Crow, all these things happened that kind of set the stage for the world that we live in today. So I hope that what you got out of this class is that you can see the present as, you know, as an offshoot of the past, okay? Uh, the past is important, okay, because it 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 creates the 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 genesis of, of of what we have today, okay. So in this class, we traveled 152 years. Uh, how has America changed? Well, I mean, pretty obviously, you know, we don't have slavery anymore. Uh, we've become a huge uh, international uh, superpower. Uh, Civil rights have, has changed dramatically for many groups. Uh, so it's changed in that way. Do we still have racial tension like we had then when, when, when the class started? We do. We still do. So it stayed the same that way, right? Um, so uh, I told you when we started that my, my purpose in this class was to teach you the real story, not my side of the story, not somebody else's side of the story, the, the story that's based on facts, okay, the real story. Without, you know, the candy-coated version, the romantic version, or just the good parts, the real story, good and bad. I, I hope I've given you a balance of that, good and bad. Uh, I, I don't think you can teach the, the, the story of America from Reconstruction to Donald Trump and not come out of it thinking that America's a great country. It clearly is. Uh, but 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 there's some there's some questionable moments and some some you know there's some thorns there that we don't like to talk about. I think we need to that that will get the real story. I think if everyone knows the real story of America, it would it would soften people's uh, aggressiveness toward each other. Okay, I mentioned way back that history did not begin with each of our lives. You know, you have to go back further. Incidents that happen today have been building up for years, decades, centuries, okay? I mentioned Black Lives Matter before as an example. What, what do they mean by that? Well, because for most of America's history, Black Lives didn't matter. So that's what they're saying. We, we matter today. We haven't always. So that's that's what the name's about. It's not about that we're better than somebody, that, that we matter more than you do. It just means, hey, it's about time. It's about time this country started to realize that we matter too, like everybody else. We're, we're the same as, as anybody else. We're citizens also. 
Okay, so again, years, decades, centuries that these these incidents have been building. It's important to understand that, or, or to learn to understand both sides of an argument. This is part of being educated, you know, uh, is not being so opinionated, not lashing out. You know, you can you can you can tell. OK, uh, take a breath. Let somebody speak. A person or a group that lashes out many times has an historical reason to do that. Doesn't mean it's right or justifiable. But an indication of a heightened anxiety and frustration. So maybe you can be sympathetic now that you know know that history goes back a long way. Uh, okay, let's see. So this is the end of our class. This is our last um, our last class. So you've you've done it. You've come to the end. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, I it's 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 uh, different to have a online class and speak without anybody in front of me, but here I am doing it. Anyway, uh, I appreciate you taking my class. I hope you enjoyed it.